This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. I'm Sophie Ikenye. Our top stories, fighting one of Africa's deadliest diseases. We have a special report on how different countries are tackling cervical cancer from the latest medication. to embracing habits and attitudes to deal with the illness. It's important that I help as many women as possible to get tested and be free from cervical cancer. My name is Falesi Mwajomba. I'm a cervical cancer survivor. On lockdown, operations at Ebola treatment centers in DR Congo are temporarily stopped after four health workers are killed in an attack by rebels. Also in the program, Reclaiming African Art, we look at a new museum in Kinshasa which aims to restore and display some of the continent's finest works of art. Thanks for joining us on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Cervical cancer is the second most common cancer among women in Africa. But according to the World Health Organization, it is the deadliest despite being a preventable disease. Cervical cancer is caused by the sexually transmitted human papillomavirus, which is the most common viral infection of the reproductive tract. In Africa, it accounts for 22% of all female cancers. In 2018, there were more than 550,000 new cases across the continent, and 81,687 women die from cervical cancer every year. Now, in the first of two stories on Focus on Africa today, we look at Rwanda, a country that experts say could become the first in Africa to tackle the disease. Millicent Akeo reports. Cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer in women globally. Angeline Usanasi was diagnosed with the disease at the age of 67. I was always a very healthy person, but in 2017 I spotted blood which was confusing because I had already passed my menopause. I went to a nearby health center where I explained to them the symptoms and they advised me to take a test. When the doctor said I have cervical cancer stage 1, I was confused and in denial. The first thought that crept into my mind was death. Angeline soon began treatment to stop the cancer from spreading. After my chemotherapy, which lasted three months at my local health center, I was sent to one of Kenya's hospital in Nairobi in March 2018 to do my radiotherapy because the therapy was not available in Rwanda at the time. Treatment for cancer in Rwanda is not free. But Angeline was among the fortunate few to receive government sponsorship to travel outside the country for treatment and she is now cancer free. Since 2006, over 80 countries worldwide have rolled out the human papillomavirus immunization or HPV. The HPV vaccine fights high risk infections which cause the majority of cervical cancer cases. But not many countries have achieved high vaccination coverage. In 2013, Rwanda extended the HPV vaccination program to include boys as well. And now it could become the model for success in fighting cervical cancer, according to the International Papillomavirus Society. As the country documents the progress they're making in the prevention and treatment of cervical cancer, free screenings have also been made available in public health facilities. Here at the Nyarugunga Health Center, more than 250 women are expected to turn up for the screenings that began early morning on this day. The target of screening is not searching for, for signs of cancer, it's for searching for precancerous lesions. Because when we, we found woman with those signs, there is a chance to treat. We can treat those precancerous signs and then we prevent for, 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 for cancer. Other countries in Africa where the HPV vaccination is given include Botswana, Ethiopia and Zimbabwe among others. The World Health Organization has approved the safety of the immunization program saying there are no reports of any harmful side effects. And experts say the results so far suggest that the vaccine introduced just 10 years ago could eventually lead to more success in tackling of the disease. Yes, like Millicent Akeo, BBC News. 
now to Malawi where we hear from uh, Falesi Mwajomba after an early diagnosis saved her life. Falesi now spreads the word around her community that getting checked regularly can save your life. Here is her story. <laughs> It's important that I help as many women as possible to get tested and be free from cervical cancer. My name is Falesi Mwajomba. I'm a cervical cancer survivor. In 2012, every time my husband and I made love, I felt a lot of pain. Whenever I went to the toilet, I noticed some pus in my urine. I went to hospital and told the doctor that I was feeling a lot of pain in my private parts. The doctor tested me. He then said, we have detected cancer and your uterus is damaged. He asked me if I would accept to have my uterus removed. Because of the way I was feeling, I gave him a go-ahead. After I felt better, I had the first lady on radio saying she was doing some work of helping people with cancer. I thought about it and decided that we could also form support groups for people diagnosed with cervical cancer. We discussed about it and decided that even though we did not have any training, we needed to start going from door to door, encouraging women to go and get tested. Cervical cancer is a difficult disease to deal with. We would face stigma and people would gossip about us. Some of the members in our group have been deserted by their husbands because they say they cannot stay with someone who doesn't have a uterus. So when we visit a woman through our door-to-door -door campaign, it's very common to find some who are reluctant to take action. Some say they don't have money to go to hospital. We therefore donate money from the group's contributions to such women and encourage them to go to hospital. <laughs> We are happy that our work in this village has been noticed. Many women have gone for screening. In early September, we appealed to the hospital authorities to go to villages and screen women there. Up to 50 people were screened in that exercise, and 11 out of those 50 were found to have cervical cancer. Our efforts are bearing fruits. I'm very proud of the women here, but we still have a lot of work to do. We would love to see cancer infection rates reduced here in Malawi. Well, let's bring in Dr. Sitna Mwanzi. She is an oncologist at the Aga Khan Hospital in Nairobi, Kenya. Thanks for taking time to talk to us on Focus on Africa. We've heard there from uh, Falesi. Now, this cancer awareness practice, where you move from door to door to make people aware, how widely is it practiced on the continent? Um, I don't think it's uh, wild, widely practiced because uh, still very many, very few people know about um, cervical cancer. But the awareness is increasing and there are more um, survivors and community groups who are starting to work towards reduction in the rates of cervical cancer. So I think this, uh, this is something that can be emulated all across Africa with good results. Hmm. How accessible is cancer treatment though uh, across the continent? So it's not very accessible because one of the major components of cervical cancer treatment is radiotherapy. And as you may know, there are very few radiotherapy machines across Africa. Like here in Kenya, we probably have five centers and they're all in the capital city. And we serve the whole region. We serve uh, Burundi, Rwanda, uh, Uganda, sometimes even patients come from Tanzania and Congo. So there are many countries that do not have radiotherapy facilities, which is a key component of um, the treatment. And then even for surgery, it's a specific surgical technique that not all gynecologists know. So even that is a limitation. Mm. So from the world perspective, where would you place Africa uh, when it comes to access uh, to cancer treatment? So we are very low on that chart. Um, and then you have certain pockets, for example, in South Africa, they have a lot of access, but you find that most of Sub-Saharan Africa, we are struggling with access to basic things such as just going for a pap smear, um, going uh, for a colposcopy or a biopsy, having a CT scan or an MRI. So just those basic diagnostic tests are uh, missing, even before we come to talk about the treatment options, which are also limited across Africa. So do we have no, uh, any, no uh, advances that are being made in Africa with regard to uh, cancer treatment at all? 
So there have been advances. They are training more and more uh, people. Chemotherapy is becoming more widely available. And we have a lot of support from the um, Atomic Energy Organization in getting radiotherapy across uh, many places. In fact, Rwanda, I think, got their first radiotherapy machine last, in the last two weeks. So there are advances, but they are slow, considering the number of cases that we have to um, take care of, which is why uh, prevention, especially for cervical cancer, is, is very key because it's something that is completely preventable. It's easy to do. You can get vaccinated and you can go for screening. And if you compare, if uh, th those um, um, prevention strategies have worked very well in the West in reducing the rates of cervical cancer. Mm. Dr. Sidna Mwanzi, thank you very much indeed for taking time to talk to us on Focus on Africa. Thank you. Now, a United Nations food expert has warned that Zimbabwe is on the brink of a man-made starvation. Hilal Elva, the UN's special rapporteur on the right to food, said 8 million people, or more than 60% of the population, were now considered food insecure, with hyperinflation preventing most households from getting enough to meet their basic needs. Now, she said the majority of the children she had met had stunted growth and were underweight. Now, operations at Ebola treatment centers in DR Congo have temporarily been suspended after four health workers were killed and five others critically injured in an attack in the northeastern part of the country. WHO chief Tedros Adamon has condemned the killings and Ebola responders are now on lockdown until the security issues have been resolved. Well, I'm joined by Jamie Letsu, who is uh, the operations manager for uh, the International Red Cross Africa. Thanks for taking time to talk to us on the program. Is it clear what happened in this incident? Well, what's clear is that our hearts go out to the families of those who've been lost. Um, we're in this together. These are our colleagues, these are our friends, our brothers and sisters in the field. And a loss of one of them is a loss to us all. Um, information, of course, is scarce, um, but we know that this is uh, a serious, serious deterioration in the security environment up there and something that has temporarily put all of our teams on hold. Um, this has the potential to have a significant impact on the evolution of the crisis. I was here in, in January and February when we also had a serious security incident that resulted in quite a significant upturn in the caseload for this epidemic. I'm afraid we may be on the edge of something similar. Um, we were at the stage where seven cases a week, less than 10, was uh, for the previous couple weeks. We're now potentially, because our teams can't move, at a stage where that may increase. Uh, and we will remain vigilant and we remain strong, but this is a risk that we do see today. So what kind of, when you talk about remaining vigilant, how exactly are you able to protect, say, the health workers uh, during these operations? Community engagement is how we protect ourselves as the Red Cross. Um, these are people in their own homes who are scared of a virus that has significant impacts uh, on your physical and your mental well-being. Uh, it has a case fatality rate of 67%, uh, and of course they're scared. So the way we approach community acceptance and security is through talking to the communities, helping them to understand what we do and why we're there for it, and to make sure that they understand that we're there to help them. That is security for us. It's community acceptance first. And this is why we've put such an emphasis on it. And now as the Red Cross, we've reached 1.9 million people with Ebola messaging. We still have a long way to go, but this for us is the most important part, a community focused, community driven response where we listen and we respond to their needs as a priority. Hmm. Jamie, there have been protests in Beni and Goma. Uh, people are really angry saying, uh, you know, the United Nations and the government really troops are not protecting them. Have those protests impacted at all on your operations, uh, the response to the Ebola crisis? Unfortunately, we're on a temporary hold right now um, in Beni, in Butembo uh, and in Mangina. Our teams have been on hibernation for, for some time now. Uh, which, of course, is a great worry for all of us. But as the Red Cross, and I think as most of us responders in the Ebola outbreak, it's not about when to leave, but how to stay. Um, the DRC Re Red Cross remains on the ground, working with the communities and risking their lives on a daily basis to beat this virus. And although we're on a temporary hold right now, we remain and we remain steadfast mm. in our commitment to see the end of this outbreak. 
All it's right. temporary, our hold right now, but we will continue until this is over. All right, Jamie Lazuro, thank you for bringing us up to speed on the situation there in that region. Let's now take a quick look at other stories making headlines across Africa. The Ugandan authorities have deported 32 Rwandans after an operation targeting illegal immigration. The group were among 200 people detained on Tuesday as part of a clampdown on unauthorized entries into Uganda. The move follows the expulsion of more than 40 Ugandans from Rwanda over the past few weeks. Jack Dorsey, the co-founder of the CEO of Twitter, said he was sad to be leaving the continent after his weeks-long visit to Nigeria, Ghana, Ethiopia and South Africa. He tweeted that Africa will define the future and announced he'd be returning for a three to six month stay next year, although he did not say exactly where or which country he'd be settling in. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Till to come in sports, the goalkeepers, the craziest people on the pitch. Are they the craziest people on the pitch? We meet one who says there might be some truth in that theory. I'm Sophie Ikenye and you're watching Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Let's find out what's happening in the world of sport now. Peter? Many thanks, Sophie. And I guess Zimbabwe international teenage Hadebe is also thankful as he can finally return to his Turkish club after he fell victim to his country's inability to produce passports. The 24-year-old who plays for Yeni Malatyaspor ran out of pages in his international passport and was unable to return to Turkey after the international break as he struggled to get a new one. Thousands of Zimbabweans have been affected, causing widespread anger and frustration. Hadebe is a key member of the Warrior Squad and represented the country at the recent Nations Cup tournament in Egypt. Let's talk rugby sevens now. And Kenya's national women's team, the Lionesses, are struggling to stay focused on training amidst serious financial struggles. It's a situation that threatens the team's build-up to the 2020 Olympics. The BBC's Lynn Wachira has more. The Kenya Lionesses on the final touches ahead of the Dubai Sevens Invitational, their first tournament since their 2020 Olympic qualification early in October. The preparations coming even as a crowd of uncertainty hung above their participation. The Kenya Lionesses need $21,000 to take part in the two-day tournament. Early this month, the Kenya Rugby Union financial troubles were cemented when a travel agency sought services of auctioneers to recover debt from the union. We're naming the team on a promise. Okay? We have not received money. We have not received tickets. So if the situation remains like that, they still won't go. It's drifting the player's mind from now pitch to thinking, now again I'm going to travel, there's no money, or am I not going to travel? It's, it's quite challenging for a player. The team that qualified for the Olympics for the second time struggles to focus on the game, but with the scarcity in women tournaments, the Dubai Sevens Invitational is crucial. The financial troubles facing the Kenya Rugby Union continue to overshadow the Kenya Lionesses at training ahead of the Dubai Sevens Invitational, but the girls have chosen to remain focused on the goal. Lynn Washira, Nairobi. Now, goalkeeping is one of the most demanding roles in many sports. And because of this, people who play in that position are sometimes seen as, well, eccentric. I mean, take, for example, retired Congolese goalkeeper Robert Kiadabel, who is well known for his goal celebration, which involved a bum shuffle. Well, from this weekend, key stoppers from all over the world will be hoping to prevent goals from being scored when the Women's Handball World Cup begins in Japan. Senegal's Hatadu Sako will be there, and she says she has been called crazy in the past. Trousers and jumpers aside, goalkeepers already look different to the other players. Hi, my name is Hata Dusako. I'm a goalkeeper at Nice Handball and for the Senegalese national team. To be a goalkeeper, you have to put any fear aside because this position exposes you to contact, receiving hits and getting hurt. So you can be scared. It's not possible to be a goalkeeper and be scared. 
Voilà, on a une tenue qui nous protège un peu plus. The outfit we wear protects our body more than the other players. We have to be ready for any type of shots, whether from a close range or far. They come in varying speeds and we need to be protected. We wear trousers to protect us from the shocks, as well as long sleeve jumpers for the same reason. In my opinion, I'm not crazy. But I often hear people on the outside say that I'm crazy because I expose myself to getting hurt. They also say that you want people to shoot at you and get hurt, but that's not the case at all. Although it is true that to be a goalkeeper, you do need to have a sprinkle of madness. We all have a sprinkle of madness, but for goalkeepers, it's definitely more prominent. Goalkeepers already look completely different to other players, but we like to be different. People don't always understand us, but we understand and love ourselves just the way we are. And you know, we had some great names in the sports today. The Zimbabwean footballer, his name is Teenage, <laughs> and the captain of the Kenyan women's rugby team, Philadelphia Orlando. I love him. <laughs> <laughs> Philadelphia Orlando. <laughs> Peter and names. Well, thank you for the sport. Thank you. Now, as African countries continue to demand the return of historical and art objects, the Democratic Republic of Congo has taken the fight a step further. The country recently opened a new National Heritage Museum. It's one of many steps to restore the country's rich cultural history, as the BBC's Gaius Kowene found out. Three years of hard work and 22 million US dollars from the South Korean International Cooperation Agency, that's what it took to build this new museum. Less than 15% of Congo's tribes have items on display. Thus, the need to either collect or repatriate ancient items from foreign museums and private collections. This museum, as you see it, was built respecting international norms and standards. We also have stores that fulfill all requirements for optimum protection of art objects. In 2013, the Democratic Republic of Congo created a school to teach art restoration and conservation. So far, only six students have graduated from this school, but courses are ongoing. All objects that you see here are authentic. Once the museum notices that an object is damaged, they bring it for us to work on it. For example, if insects attack a wooden object, they bring it to us and we fix it. The opening of this new museum and the beginning of academic training in conservation and restoration of art objects opens up infinite possibilities for Congolese contemporary artists. We are at Académie des Beaux-Arts, one of the oldest and most prominent art school in DRC. I came here to understand why this new museum and its collection are so important for upcoming artists. Emem Pane teaches contemporary arts to young students here. For a museum, you don't need to be physically inside. It would be great if they had an online collection to inspire artists who are not in Congo, Kinshasa, and can't visit in person. The challenge is now to maintain this museum and its collection intact in a constantly changing political context of a country yearning to own its past and rewrite its present. Gaius Kourini, BBC News, Kinshasa. Well, there's an item that will be returned to the continent. A bronze cockerel at Cambridge University has been looted uh, in a British raid on what is now Nigeria. The Benin bronze, known as an Okuko, was given to the university in 1930 by a former British Army officer. In 2016, it was removed from display and the Legacy of Slavery Working Party recommended it to be returned. Well, that's Focus on Africa for now. Thank you for your company.